Because many folks who are poor are actually experientially rich. And sometimes they're spiritually rich. I've, I've seen both conservatives and liberals walk into, pure, into poor communities like they're walking onto a yacht. And sometimes people with more money arrive giving orders rather than asking questions that can deepen rather than alleviate problems. Welcome to Act in Line, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. In this episode, we're bringing you one of the plenary lectures from Acton University 2023, titled The Law of Conservation of Welfare and What Energy Source Can Transform It, by Marvin Olasky, former editor-in-chief of World Magazine and an affiliate scholar here at the Acton Institute. The Law of Conservation of Mass dates from Antoine Lavoisier's 1789 discovery that mass is neither created nor destroyed in chemical reactions. Evidence of the past three decades leads Olasky to suggest a parallel law of conservation of welfare regarding political reactions. In 1995 to 1996, the first GOP majority House of Representatives in four decades changed AFDC, or Aid to Families with Dependent Children, into TANF, Temporary Aid to Needy Families, but left alone dozens of other programs. As work requirements and time limits reduced the number of AFDC slash TANF recipients, programs such as SNAP, SSI, and SSDI expanded. The conservation of welfare is not good for many recipients who would be much better off with challenging personal and spiritual help. But changing the law requires a change from outside current chemical configurations. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Acton Line on our website at acton.org slash actonline. And if you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act in Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Marvin Olasky is a senior fellow of the Discovery Institute, an affiliate scholar at the Acton Institute, and from 1983 to 2021, he was professor, provost, chairholder, and dean at the University of Texas, Austin, the King's College in New York, Patrick Henry College, and the World Journalism Institute. He is the author of 28 books and has written 5,000 articles in top publications, including the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, Fortune, and more. I first interacted with Marvin uh, when I read his book, The Tragedy of American Compassion, when I was in grad school in Southern California in 2020, and it changed the way I looked at how poverty in America has developed. And it was an absolute pleasure when he said yes for, uh, to join us for the closing plenary. So please give a warm act and welcome to Marvin Olasky. Well, thank you all. It was a great pleasure to be here. It's a great pleasure to be able to sit with Father Sirico. We've known each other for many years. And congratulations to all of you on making it to the last night. There's still a lot of energy in this, in this building, but I'm an old guy who's been to lots of conferences, so I cannot yet say that this is a great conference. The mark of a great conference is not what happens at the conference, but what happens after it. And that's up to you. I'm going to tell you three stories. Here's number one about John D. Rockefeller. As many of you know, he built a big oil business. In 1900, he was by far the richest man in the world. And he was personally a small spender. He avoided debt. 
He did not buy expensive clothing. As a young man, he traveled by train and particularly enjoyed a railroad station that offered an all-you-can-eat lunch. All you could eat at the station, that is, when a train conductor yelled, all aboard, Rockefeller maximized his intake. He said he had a big mouth, then, quoting here, he said, before going, I'd stuff my cheeks with food, then spend a long time aboard the train eating what I had carried away. So I hope you all will chew for a long time on what you heard this week. Here's my second story. This week brings the 75th anniversary of the Republican Convention of 1948. It was a triumphant occasion. Republicans had a majority in the House of Representatives. They had a big lead in public opinion polls. And then Republicans nominated what the pundits called a dream ticket. The president, the governor of New York, the largest state then, Thomas Dewey. Her vice president, the governor of California, Earl Warren, California then being the second largest state. The dream ticket. The Democrats just nominated Harry Truman. He had become president when Franklin Roosevelt died. He had never campaigned nationally. The likelihood of Truman gaining election on his own seemed pretty small. And then it got worse. Southern Democrats walked out of the Democratic Convention. They ran their own candidate, Strom Thurmond of South Carolina. Because these, these Southern Democrats did not like it when Truman said that discrimination on the basis of color is just plain wrong. Truman said, and I'll quote here, the federal government has a clear duty to see that the constitutional guarantees of individual liberties and of equal protection under the law are not denied or abridged anywhere in the Union, end quote. Now, a reporter asked Strom Thurmond why the Southerners walked away from the Democratic Party under Truman. And the reporter said, well, after all, Franklin Delano Roosevelt had said pretty much what Truman was saying. Strom Thurmond replied, but Truman really means it. Now, what does it mean to really mean something? It means, among other things, risking your job to stand up for what's right. Southern states back then were the solid South for Democrats. Truman lost them when he said he was not only for civil rights, but he meant it. He issued the first executive order for desegregation of the military. Here you had African-American soldiers in World War I and World War II giving their lives, and they were still facing discrimination. Truman's political advisor said, don't do it. You lose the Southern vote. And Truman went ahead anyway. He meant it. So those are two things to keep in mind as you leave here. What will you chew on? And if you say and think and understand that you've learned something in these four days and you want to take action of some kind, do you mean it? Now, here's my third story, and it's my own. How did I learn the difference between welfare and, I guess, what we could call despair fear? Welfare that helps people fare well versus welfare that discourages marriage and work. So how did I learn the history? How did I see what goes wrong? How did I get some sense of how things can go right? How can you learn? You need to understand the principles involved. I suspect you've learned a lot during these four days. And you need to understand the realities of economics and markets. You need a worldview. I strongly recommend one based on the Bible. And then relating the general to the specific. My method is as old as Aristotle and as young as today's tweets. Don't talk in cosmic generalities. Get specific operate at street level, not sweet level. Now, I'll repeat that because my reporters for decades heard this until they were probably nauseated. Street level, not sweet level. And so this third story, my own, involves three steps to get a street level sense of what's involved in fighting poverty. 
Step one, I wanted to find out how Americans used to help the poor, so I spent a year in the Library of Congress. And at first I sat in the beautiful reading room, painting, statues, all the trimmings. I filled out slips with names of books. Staff members go to floors in the stacks and they see all the books and they brought me back the ones I asked for. But that was doing research at sweet level, like I was Lord of the Library, just sitting there and have people bring books to me, but I didn't really know what to ask. I didn't know what was there. It wasn't, a lot of stuff wasn't in the card catalog. I wasn't aware of it. So after a month of sitting there lordly in the, in the wonderful reading room, I got permission to go into the stacks myself. And this was literally blowing dust off old documents that were just on the shelves there and probably hadn't been looked at for years, maybe decades. And the other thing is there were no rules of library quiet in the stacks because the people who got the books, they had boom boxes at this time, this is 30 years ago, they were listening to rap music. No rules of library quiet, so it was uh, really interesting to read these documents from 100, 200 years ago uh, while listening to rap music and so forth. And so it was with that resource that I was able to write this book that was referred to The Tragedy of American Compassion. So that's the first step, actually, doing the research. And then, well, here's step two. It happened at Christmas time in 1994 that the upcoming Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich, read this book. I like to think of him as the king written in the book of Esther, but could not sleep. And then he learned how Esther's uncle Mordecai had saved him from assassination. Maybe it happened that way, maybe it didn't. I've heard different stories. Um, you know, if he was reading it late at night, that would worry me a little bit, because there was one person who read the book a few years back. She gave me a great compliment. She said, that is such a good book. I read a page every night before I fall asleep. But... Uh, yeah, New, New read it, he liked it, and he made it possible for me to spend a lot of time in Washington watching the one big change that Congress has made in welfare during the past 50 years. And that became the second part of my education. I was able to talk one-to-one -one with lots of senators and representatives and get a sense of who really cared, who really meant it, and who did not. There was one time I talked with a group of, say, 40 members of the House of Representatives, mostly from middle-class suburban districts with some pockets of poverty, and I explained some of the history, and they were all nodding and smiling and saying they wanted to be helpful. And then I challenged them. Do you really mean it? I suggested that to actually understand the type of personal, individual compassion that really made a difference in the lives of the poor, of the poor for so many decades, that they should commit for a year to spending, say, an hour or two each week, no cameras, just helping a poor person in their district. Um, easiest would be help a second grader learn to read, because if second graders can't read and they get to the fourth grade and they still can't read, then they're off to a, probably a miserable life, trouble coming. You know, harder is, is helping a homeless man get his life in order. But do it with the cameras off. Maybe the story will come out eventually, I told him, but do it to help a person to learn yourself what works, what's really needed, what it means to mean it. And these members of Congress just didn't want to do it. Said, don't have the time. They said they wanted to help the poor, but they, at least I, my sense is they didn't really mean it. They didn't take the time to learn what it really is like at street level. Maybe a couple of them knew it from their own experience, but most did not. And they just did not want to spend the time that way. They were willing to vote for a particular piece of legislation, but they weren't really meaning it. And what's the result of not really meaning it? In 1996, Congress passed, and Bill Clinton, under some political pressure, signed into law a bill they changed the program. Older people among here will remember Aid to Families with Dependent Children, AFDC, and they gave it a new name, Temporary Aid to Needy Families, TANF, T-A-N-F. And there was some good done by that. A lot of people who were physically and mentally able to work and did not have small children, they went to work. Uh, a lot of these people came out of poverty, and I actually tracked some of them over the years. That was good. But Republicans changed only one program and then declared victory. It could have been a banner, mission accomplished. But very little was really accomplished because if you trace it out, Congress would not change dozens of other programs. And as the number of people on AFDC TANF fell, a lot of those people slid over to other programs like SSI, SSDI, SNAP. There's a whole alphabet soup of programs here. And a lot of those programs enabled them not to leave poverty, but to stay in it. And a lot of programs meant to help actually hurt. And this is what I call, um, trying to be a little bit of a social scientist here, 
the law of conservation of welfare. Some of you may remember from school the law of conservation of mass. Uh, Antoine Lavoisier discovered in 1789 that in chemical reactions, mass is neither created nor destroyed. And that's been the way it's pretty much been about welfare spending in America. For, for 60 years, with good intentions, it stayed pretty much the same. We've had a very busy and, and intellectually energetic week here. I'll spare you the statistics right here. I'll include some of them in an article I'm writing for, for the Acton Magazine, uh, Religion and Liberty. But the law of conservation of welfare means that programs take on a life of their own. And they can be destructive. We'll give you examples in two areas, the effect on marriage and also the effect on homelessness. Marriage is the greatest poverty device, poverty fighting device in world history. Uh, and yeah, um, I, will, I will take that applause. I'm happy to say that my wife and I will be celebrating our 47th anniversary next week. So, and I know from personal experience, marriage pushes young adults to grow up and be responsible. And then just the economics of it. Uh, uh, two can live almost as cheaply as one. Um, being a single mom is really, really hard. I've, I've known some of them. It's, it's not so hard when there are two adults to share the burden and the joys. Um, kids almost always do better with a dad than without one. And the 40% of kids now born outside of marriage often find that out. And you'd think the politicians would be really careful not to do anything that cuts into marriage. Nope. Um, you know, I, I think I'll drop out the statistics here, except for one thing, because here's something you all, you all know from your own experience. If you, if you have a good income and, uh, and you got married recently and, and your husband and wife also work, you probably know, happily know, that marriage does not push you into a higher tax bracket. They used to, but tax brackets generally cut off, uh, but generally double for, for married couples filing jointly. So let's say there's, there's a Jane in the audience who earns $40,000 per year and Joe earns $40,000 per year. If they get married, they don't pay higher taxes at the margin. And that's good for middle class people. But one of the things that happens when you don't really mean and you don't, and you don't know what actually goes on at street level is um, for lots of people uh, who are poor and are on welfare of various sorts, there is a marriage penalty. And basically, you know, for a lot of people in public housing problems, for a lot of people in, in just a whole variety of the, of the uh, uh, alphabet soup programs, get married, you lose benefits. I'll give you one example that I've just been looking into recently because Texas, uh, like a lot of other states, has this. Uh, state pre state level preschool programs have penalties that discourage marriage, uh, at least in Texas and again a lot of other states. Single moms can send kids to preschool free of charge. Marriage often eliminates the entire benefit. So here in Texas, for example, a single mom earning twenty thousand to thirty three thousand dollars per year receives free preschool. And we can get into debates about whether Preschool like that is, is good or not, but you know, it's, it's free and something, and single moms can often desperately need it. But if she marries a man who makes another $23,000, she loses all her benefits. So there's a marriage penalty right there of more than $5,000. I can give you some other statistics too, but it's, uh, it's pretty well established that rules promoted and promulgated at the suite level have street level consequences. Um, there was a survey taken several years back asking uh, men and women below the poverty line and people who would know others in their same economic situation, how often do you think unmarried adults choose not to get married to avoid losing welfare benefits? And half the people said often or almost always. That is, they know people in that situation. You cut down on marriage, you bring up poverty. You cut down on marriage, you make life a lot harder for kids. Um, Let's turn to homelessness. There's a California study, here's news, this was released just two days ago. A really good survey of 3,200 people, uh, homeless people, asking reasons why you are homeless, what's happened to you. 82% of them said they had a mental health condition. But it was also 82% who said that if someone had given them $5,000 to $10,000, they would not have been homeless. Um, 65% acknowledged use of illicit drugs, 62% acknowledged heavy drinking. There's some overlap in those figures, but if you put them together, that's, that's the vast, vast majority of people who are homeless. But 70% said they figured that if they had just another $300 or $500 a month, they would not have been homeless. 
90% said if they had received a voucher that paid their rent, they would not have been homeless. Okay, maybe. I'm not going to judge whether several hundred or several thousand dollars would have made the difference. Sometimes true. I'm, in fact, I know that's true for some people. Uh, but for many with substance addictions, any additional money just, just feeds the addiction, which is something to keep in mind, sadly, when there are people in the street who are asking you for money. Um, you know, Matthew 25 is a wonderful verse about as you do to the least of these, you do to me. But it cuts both ways. Uh, when you're helping someone who, who, uh, who needs food and shelter and everything, then you can be doing a, a godly thing. It may be like Jesus, like helping Jesus himself. On the other hand, if, as some studies have shown, 90% of that money is going to be used for drugs or alcohol. It's like you're sticking heroin into Jesus' veins. It's a tough verse. It cuts both ways. But here's what I want to stress, that it's really complicated why people become homeless. There are structural factors that are important. I mean, a lot of places, particularly in California, not enough housing, rents have gone up a lot. But there are also personal factors that are really important, mental health and substance abuse. But you can guess, I've been tracking this the last couple of days, you can guess how that study was reported. A study that was a pretty comprehensive study that looked at a lot of factors and said it's complicated. But here's the way the headlines went. This is Associated Press. A new study says high housing costs Low income pushed Californians into homelessness. You don't hear about, you don't read anything about substance abuse until you get to the 13th paragraph. ABC News, the report highlights the impact of low incomes and high housing costs. Again, doesn't get into substance abuse, doesn't get into mental health. There's a KALW TV station. New study says housing costs the root cause of California's homelessness. That's actually not what the study says. It says that's one of the important causes but mental illness and substance abuse, really important. Uh, Fortune Magazine had a headline just quoting Governor Gavin Newsom, people are homeless because their rent is too high. Well, yeah, but um, substance abuse, mental health, also very important factors. So in a sense, we have these terms racist, we have these terms classist, maybe we have to have a term called housist, where you don't look at mental health questions, you don't look at addiction questions, you just say, oh, the problem is clearly just lack of a house, and let's spend in Los Angeles $600,000 or more to, to get an apartment for this person, and the problems go away. Well, they don't. What you hear typically in reporting is housing, housing, housing. That's the official U.S. government position right now ever since 2013. Housing first. But that's bad reporting, and it's, it's much more complicated. It's a mental health problem. It's a substance abuse problem. It's a rent problem. Um, yes, you can you pay more, but if you ignore the other problems, you're making life better for the people who drive by or walk by homeless encampments. We're, we're, those of us who aren't homeless, we're not going to be troubled by seeing these folks and wondering, well, should I be doing something or not? They're not helping the people who live in those camps. So that's a problem, and it's real. So I mentioned that to learn at street level rather than street level, I, I, I had to do three things. I mean, first, blow the dust off the old documents in the Library of Congress. Second, see up close how people in Washington make laws. And the third was seeing for myself around the country whether there are alternatives to the welfare system. Um, you know, the Johnny Cash song, I've been everywhere. And I, you know, on Sesame Street, the Count was my favorite Sesame Street character. So I once counted 153 cities or towns where I've actually visited, seeing close up organizations created to help the poor. And if I could sing, I would, yeah, I would, you know, San Antonio, San Diego, San Francisco, St. Louis, Nashville, Jacksonville, Louisville, Asheville, Gainesville, Colleyville, Cedarville, Charlottesville. I've seen compassion everywhere, man. Um, but I'm not going to sing anymore. That's really bad. Uh, but I want to say I'm 73. Father Sirico sitting next to me confessed that he was 72, and I just said, whoa, what a young man you are. I'm, uh, I'm 73 and still learning, so next month I plan to spend four days at a, a homeless shelter just south of Los Angeles and another couple of days just walking around San Francisco and just learning about what's going on right now. Um, you can learn the libraries, and one of the things I hope you've learned these four days is the importance of spending time in the libraries and reading really good stuff, philosophical stuff, political science stuff, economic stuff. You also learn on the streets. The important thing these days, it's really easy, and in many ways, maybe it serves a market just to give your opinion, and the louder the better. Uh, it's harder to actually do, uh, do reporting, real reporting. So um, what I want to suggest here is be on the streets and see at street level 
But government programs, even with the best of intentions, do things like having marriage penalties. They often enable people to stay poor, and that's because they are, I'll just give you one acronym, they are EBB and not CPS. I'll explain this. EBB, entitling, bureaucratic, and attempting to banish God. Not successful in that, but trying. And that's the way it works for lots of governmental programs. Once you get on, you can stay on, even if you're able to work and you choose not to. Most of them are bureaucratic. You become a number rather than a real person. Most of them attempt to banish God from any counseling or training. EBB, entitling, bureaucratic, trying to banish God. And that's a big problem. And it's a huge problem because it's believed to have made in God's image. It changes hearts. That's the, that's the energy source that electrifies lives. EBB programs usually don't help people climb out of poverty. And I'm not saying this out of an abstract position. Again, this is what I've seen. Effective compassion takes the word compassion literally. Calm, passion, with suffering. Suffering with those in need, not just writing a check or paying taxes. So effective compassion is not EBB. Effective compassion is CPS. Challenging, personal, and spiritual. You know, we talk about CPR to save a person who's mostly dead, almost dead. CPS, saving a society that otherwise may be dying. So that's the question. Is EBB the best we can do? Um, I can't see you from here because the lights and so forth, so I'm just going to have to guess on this. But I'll tell you what, as I spoke around the country a lot during the 1990s and more recently, I would always ask a question. If you had $500 to give to any poverty fighting organization, raise your hand if you'd give it to the uh, Federal Department of Health and Human Services. I, I hear laughter, I can't see the hands, but uh, yeah, typically I'll tell you in my experience, almost no hands went up. There may have been, there may have been three hands and, I'll, and they were all professors. That's an anti-professor drug, drug, which I shouldn't make. Uh, you know, how about your state government? Would you send it to the state capital and no? Would you send it to City Hall, maybe one or two people out of a couple hundred? I'd ask, how many of you know the community-based, non-governmental group, whether church or secular, in your own area, that would do a better job with that $500? And just for everyone to raise a hand. So there's, this is challenging personal and spiritual programs. And they also emphasize what we have, not what we don't have. The question that is asked when you tend to go into governmental offices do you have a physical, mental, or other health problem that limits the kind or amount of work you can do? Now, that's an important question to ask, but the first question should be, what capabilities or skills do you have? So emphasizing not what you don't have, but what you do. And then also learning, and this is what I learned traveling in poor neighborhoods uh, a lot, uh, how, how much better it is to work inside out rather than outside in. Because many folks who are poor are actually experientially rich. And sometimes they're spiritually rich. I've, I've seen both conservatives and liberals walk into, pure, into poor communities like they're walking onto a yacht. And sometimes people with more money arrive giving orders rather than asking questions that can deepen rather than alleviate problems. So basically, we should not do for others what they can do for themselves. The best way to help is asking people what you can do and then helping them do it. But you don't get that when people in office suites draw up programs without understanding their impact on the street. Um, so my Washington experience, and then comparing with what I saw around the country, left me, this is a confession, it left me without a lot of confidence in Washington. I suspect a lot of you are going to say, what? No confidence in Washington? No, this, is the, this, this audience is a, is a smart audience. There's a, maybe, you'll, maybe you'll appreciate it. This is a Texas joke about a farm mom who looks out of her kitchen window and she sees her daughter talking with a strange man. And she yells, didn't I tell you not to talk to strangers? You come into this house right now. And the girl responds, but Mama, this man says he's a United States senator. And of course, her wise mother replies, well, in that case, you come in double quick. That's a Texas joke. But I think that it probably has application in Michigan as well. So I, I uh, yeah, I want, I want you to leave chewing on what you've learned and remembering that words to be worthwhile need to lead to action. I mentioned the Republican convention that occurred 75 years ago this week, but there's another 75th anniversary uh, worth remembering in connection with Harry Truman, who, I've, uh, despite being a Democrat, I've been doing some writing about it recently, and I've found I actually like him, because uh, he meant it on a lot of important things. 
And so four days from now, June 26th, was the beginning of a semi-miraculous feat, the Berlin Airlift. As the Cold War became frigid, the Soviet Union wanted the United States to abandon Berlin, which was surrounded then by communist East Germany. The Russians and East Germans cut off all access to West Berlin by highway or railroad. And for a year, the United States flew in 2.3 tons of fuel, uh, excuse me, 2.3 million tons of food, fuel, and supplies to West Berlin. And finally, the Russians gave in, just as they finally gave in after Ronald Reagan pressured them in the 1980s. Truman and Reagan both hoped that countries like Ukraine would one day be independent, and they meant it. So the public opinion pollsters were confident in 1948 that the dream ticket, Dewey and Warren, would win. They were so confident they stopped polling two weeks before the election. And of course, and some of you may have seen the famous picture of Truman then the next day holding up a Chicago Tribune with the headline, Dewey defeats Truman. Uh, you can see it on the internet, a uh, big smile. Uh, Americans had respected Truman's integrity. He meant it, he won. So as you head home, uh, please be a John D. Rockefeller and chew on something. Be a Harry Truman, uh, without some of his policies, but with a lot of them, and mean it. And if you do, I'd be amazed if you can't find something helpful to be in your own community. So if you care about education, spend an, an hour a week helping a second grader who hardly reads. If you call yourself pro-life, see how you can help at your local crisis pregnancy center or pregnancy resource center. Uh, a lot of you are the perfect age to be peer counselors to young men or young women. And you may be able to save one life and change one another. Do not let despair triumph. And then I have one more suggestion if you're interested in journalism. Uh, go to zengerhouse.com. It's one word, Zenger, Z-E-N-G-E-R-H-O-U-S-E, zengerhouse.com. At the top, you'll see a short menu. Go to local views. Uh, my wife and I, uh, 10 years ago, started, started a, a little foundation, a very tiny foundation, just putting aside some money every year. It's called Zenger House. It's named after a 1730s newspaper editor, a Christian named John Peter Zenger. Uh, we taught a week-long training course last summer, and we may teach another next summer for people with some writing ability and also some entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial ability who want to start a new site in their own towns. See, if you're, if you're in an affluent area, there are now papers, uh, there are now publishers doing that because they can sell ads. If you're in a poor area, it becomes more difficult. So we're training people to set up local news websites in poorer communities. We've just started one, or actually one person who went through our training has started one in a southwestern area of, of, uh, of Houston called Sharpstown. We hope to see more. So if you have any writing skills, if you have an entrepreneurial uh, streak, uh, send us an email. You can just go to uh, zenderhouse.com. Uh, time to conclude, and I want to conclude, because as Father Sirico and I were, were talking, as you get older, you, you think about people who have died. And one person I very much admired uh, was a pastor who died recently in New York City named Tim Keller. Uh, and Tim Keller really taught me a lot about, his, about understanding our relations as people God created to God's magnificence as the Creator. And he taught us that we're more sinful than we imagined, yet God loves us more than we could hope for. So if someone brags, I know I'm a good person, you can try to bring that person back to earth, saying, well, no, you're not. We're all sinners. We're more sinful, actually, than we can imagine. But if someone despairs, I've thrown away my life, I'm useless. You hear this a lot from long-term homeless people. Might as well kill myself, you know, maybe I won't slip my wrist, but I'll drink myself to death. And you can say, well, please don't. God made you in his image, and you are loved more than you can imagine. Um, that's what I learned from Tim, who died a couple of weeks ago. And just one suggestion to you all, uh, when I walk my dog, uh, I, I listen to Tim Keller's sermons. It's eerie he's died, but his sermons are still there. Uh, and you can just uh, listen to them on a podcast. Uh, they're free to, uh, to listen to. And if you just put in Tim Kelly, you'll do that. I learned a lot from him. I think some of you will, will too. Um, would you mind if I, if I closed with a, with a really quick prayer? Um, I can't see anyone frowning at this point, so I hope so. That's so. Um, yeah, Father in heaven, um, we, we pray for your grace on everyone who planned and taught and learned during this conference week. Please keep us safe as we travel home. Uh, please inspire us to mean what we've heard and what we say. 
Please inspire us to chew on this. We are more sinful than we imagined, yet you love us more than we could hope for. Amen. Thank you all. Well, thank you, Marvin, for those uh, excellent comments. Uh, those of you in the audience, please remember to send in your questions. We've had fantastic questions over the last week. Um, please send that into slido.com and use the code AU2023. Um, one question for, from me to start off with, I couldn't help but think as I was listening of a core value at Acton, we, uh, it comes from Catholic social teaching, but the concept of subsidiarity. Those who are closest to a problem are best able to understand, handle, or think through a problem. Um, what do you think, from your experience of studying this topic, what are some of the most effective, I guess, bullseye organizations that are local have, that you have seen success in thinking through some of these issues of poverty? Good question. Um, and it brings, to, it brings to mind dead people at this point. Uh, uh, the organizations are still going. And for example, well, I'll start with a fellow named Bob Cote, uh, who was, uh, had been a drunk on the streets of Denver. And he one day, just uh, through God's grace, uh, poured out his bottle and started a program called Step 13, uh, which, I, which I visited uh, and spent some time there. And I'm going to go back there uh, in August and see what's happened then. Because he died a few years ago. And Bob Cote based Step 13 on the program. He used to say, work works. And work was really important. And the way it was organized, this is a homeless shelter, the way it was organized is the, the first floor uh, is just sort of an open, um, you know, just a whole bunch of beds there. And you can start working right away. Uh, brilliantly, it's two blocks away from the Colorado Rockies uh, ballpark. And so they have a parking area there and people can leave their cars there and so they get some revenue, but also ask to have the cars detailed. And so they put people to work doing that and doing other, other work and getting jobs. And if they work industriously, uh, then they move up to the next floor where there are semi-private rooms, maybe uh, four people, let's say, in there, four beds in there. And then if they keep making progress, they can go up to the next floor, which has single rooms with a lock on the door, and they can start getting, uh, 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 they, they can get have a cell phone and so forth, they can get a television, they can do all the stuff, and so they're moving up, and by the time they're ready to move out, they actually know what it's like to have their own place. And so it's very cleverly done, and Bob was able to do that from his own experience being a homeless guy and just seeing the way that would work. Uh, Hannah Hawkins, uh, in Washington, a program called Children of Mind, uh, which is only, it's only three miles away from the Capitol, and I once sat down with uh, Tom Daschle and five Democratic senators. Now, uh, Tom Daschle at that point was, was the, the Democratic leader, and just said, you should go see this program. It's only three miles away, and I can't cost you. Uh, to my knowledge, he never did, uh, and they never did. But Hannah Hawkins, it's called Children of Mind because there were about 75 kids who came after school every day, and she was like a mother to them. And these were kids sometimes who didn't have very good moms. And she would say things like, I mean, she knew these kids, and she would say things like to, uh, to a 10-year-old, your armpits stink. And, you know, he didn't take that amiss because uh, he understood that she loved him. So, you know, that program... It wasn't as cleverly constituted as the, as the floor by floor, but uh, it was love, basically, and the kids understood that, and he was someone who was actually paying attention to them and loving them, and they didn't have anyone else in their lives like that. So I could go on, but uh, those are just a couple, and, and, and they're still going with other people, and I hope they're still going well. Absolutely. That's good. Um, I'm going to combine a few questions sure. that are on the same thing. I'll try to be shorter in my answer. No, no. That's, that's having concrete examples is right. fantastic. Um, tell me a little bit about um, your influential career in journalism. You have almost four decades, right? Or uh -huh. longer. Um, there is, what, what, what is your opinion or thoughts on the influence of social media and journalism in the current milieu? What, what we're seeing, mm -hmm. both in the poverty conversation, the headlines, you mentioned a few in your talk, but even in general, what, what is, the, is there a power there that we haven't seen in the past? What, what are your thoughts on the current movement? Oh, good question. There's a lot of power there. And it could be power that would actually be wonderful. 
because it could be power that would allow people to get a whole lot of different viewpoints. When I grew up in the Boston area, uh, basically, you either subscribe to the liberal newspaper, the Boston Globe, or the conservative newspaper, the Boston Herald. That was it. And, you know, I, I look back and, and I think the Herald was probably better than the Globe. I worked in the Globe for a while, and I worked in the Globe actually when I was a member of the Communist Party way back uh, 50 years ago. Uh, and I wrote propaganda, essentially, which the, which the editors liked. But that's a different story for a different time, I think. Right. I'd love right. to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but that was, that was what you had. You, you got that. You either got the liberal viewpoint or the conservative viewpoint. The wonderful thing about social media is you can get all kinds of viewpoints. That's the wonderful thing. That's the thing in theory. Mm -hmm. In practice, and this is sad, most people just tend to get the viewpoints they like. And that becomes really bad because then they are they're in the echo chamber. Uh, conservatives used to have some advantage in that and that, let's say, you could, get, you, could, you could read National Review, and maybe you could also read the Boston Globe, and so forth. But now the tendency, again, on the right and on the left, is just to read stuff on the right and the left. And so you, and so, uh, you, you can go on believing stuff that just isn't true, and you don't get challenged in that. Another one from the audience, uh, thinking through the concept in your book, that you seem to be saying that bad charity drives out good charity. Can you please uh, explain or expand on how that works? Well, yeah, uh, this, this was my attempt to gain immortality by being somewhat like Gresham, right? His, his, his line is bad, is bad money drives out good. So I'm saying bad charity drives out good in this way. Um, and I've actually had this experience. Okay, my, uh, my wife and I and a couple of other couples uh, started a, uh, a Christian school for people both rich and poor, black and white and brown. Uh, we started this back uh, 22 years ago. Uh, and amazingly enough, it's still going. I mean, it has about 100, it's not a big deal. It has 100 students or so. Um, but one of the things we found is that uh, as it, when I was very active and I, I chaired it for a while, uh, we found parents who were saying, hey, uh, this school is better. I can see it's better than the, than the pretty bad public school my child goes to. But at the public school, there's, there's free transportation to it, there's free lunch, and now there's free breakfast and free dinner and all these types of things. And yeah, I know, I know the school would be better, but I just, I just can't afford it, I can't take the time, I don't have a vehicle, whatever. So there's an example, in a sense, of, uh, uh, I'm not sure it's exactly charity or public school system, but it's, it's something inferior driving out something superior just because the economic benefits are, are there, and that's too bad. But I've seen this in other programs too, in programs involving uh, other, uh, involving poor people in other ways, that once you get used to thinking of it as an entitlement that you don't have to do anything for, it's really hard for another program to come along and say, no, it's not re it really shouldn't be an entitlement, you can earn it, you are capable, you are mentally and physically capable of doing some work, and so you should earn it, and it'll be good for you. Uh, and the tendency is to say, well, no, I don't have to do that. I can get it all for free. So that would, those would be the examples right, right off, the, off the top of my head of, of bad charity driving up good. What do you think about some of the more modern um, issues? Um, at our table, we were having a conversation about housing prices at, at, at dinner. Um, housing, and there are certain costs in the modern American world that seem to be spiraling out of control. And do you think there's, there's several questions around this idea? In fact, one is very personal. They say, um, I've been homeless multiple uh, times, and the increasing cost of housing was a significant problem yeah. um, in helping us uh, stay homeless, or creating us to stay homeless. What, what are your thoughts about some of these costs? I mean, aren't there real um, problems, in uh, structural problems that are possibly problems that could be overcome with regulation or laws? Are there, are there any ways that we can help affect it top down versus bottom up? Um, zoning is a, is a big problem. Now, right. there, are, there are advantages to it, but disadvantages uh, to it. Uh, um, the, uh, the, the, the cost of building housing uh, with all the regulations are involved. Are you, be, will more regulation help? Probably not. It'll probably make things worse in a lot of ways. Because the, the, the cost is, is so high in a lot of uh, places, particularly in California, but other places too, 
Um, so all these things that are designed to help, and it sometimes may help. I mean, we don't want buildings that are going to fall down, but there's so much of it uh, and so much permission that's required to do something that's, that's pretty sensible is that it just drives up the cost. And that's, that is the, the, the cost of housing is a, is a, uh, is a huge problem. Um, there's, there's no reason, for example, if, uh, if someone has a, uh, a big house and George living in the big house, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to build on your property a, a tiny house right there and have someone, someone there. There's, there's, there's no reason why uh, in a lot of places, well, maybe there are reasons, but in a lot of places, uh, if, if people build on a lot, uh, a, a place with four apartments, uh, you know, is it going to drive down maybe the housing prices? Maybe a little bit, but it's actually going to make living possible for more people. So I think there are a lot of things. I mean, here I tend to be, uh, you know, pretty much a libertarian, uh, saying, saying overall, the fewer regulations, the better. Uh, and uh, let freedom ring. Let liberty grow. Let's have more housing. That, thank you. It's good. We have time for one more question, and I'm going to combine several again there uh, thematically. And one thing that sets Acton apart from a lot of different organizations that we, we want to bring in the religious conversation to these ideas um, and many houses of worship um, locally. Uh, the, the Mormon church has good examples of this, the Amish, other, you, we can look at examples, but our local churches, do, do you think in your studies and, and thoughts that local churches are one of the best conduits for these kinds of pro, uh, issues? Or are they nonprofits uh, locally, you know, sourced? Um, what are, are churches and religious organizations responsible for helping to turn this idea around? Yeah. Historically, that's what they were. I mean, they were they they were the best, and they were they were very active. Um, and then sometimes a group of churches got together and set up a a, a, a nonprofit organization, but it was still church based. Because again, this is the I I don't like to put everything into a formula, but, uh, you know, this is something I've, I've been trying to preach for the past 30 years, challenging personal and spiritual. And if you leave out the spiritual component, which comes naturally to churches, uh, there may be a few exceptions, but, but uh, uh, it, it's there. It's there, and, and that's, that's crucial. Because it's so much, uh, you know, Imago Dei, the image of God. I mean, that's the crucial thing. And if you don't have that, if you don't have that about yourself, then you do all kinds of things that, that you, probably, you probably know you should not do. If you don't have that about other people, then the tendency very often is sometimes in a very kind way to treat and think of poor people the way I treat and think of my dog. I'm very fond of my dog, but I don't expect my dog to, to work. He's a pet. Uh, you know, put food in his, in his bowl in the morning, put food in his bowl uh, uh, at, uh, at 3 o'clock, those were his two meals a day, two squares a day, whether he earns it or not. Uh, scratch him on the belly, let him lie on the couch, and then we walk around uh, two or three miles in the, uh, in the morning, and sometimes I listen to sermons. And my one spiritual gift, I'm an elder in my church, I tend to walk around a lot with some of the younger members of the church, so uh, half the days I'm doing that, and half of the days uh, uh, I'm listening to, uh, to Keller sermons. Uh, and my dog comes along, so he's, 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 he's a great prop. And that way he works for his food, but basically he doesn't. Uh, if we treat people like animals, like pets, and, and again, in the kindest way, and I, 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 don't want to, I don't want to say that these are evil people doing it, but that's the tendency you get into. You don't expect from them. You, you expect them to be takers and not givers. But uh, one of the things I heard at a, at a wonderful place called the Gospel Mission in, in Washington, D.C., was the, the pastor regularly saying, you don't have to be just a taker. You can also be a giver. And this is to homeless people and saying, there's stuff you can do. You have attributes, you have qualities, and you are made in God's image. You're not a pet. Uh, you're not a mascot. You're a human being, and there's a lot you can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we a lot of times have, uh, we treat poor like the objects yeah. to be pitied rather than the subjects of their own story. Yeah. And um, that's a, a good closing thought. I, I really do appreciate your ideas on poverty. They've, they've um, manifested my own life thinking through these topics. And so thank you for your career. Thank you for the investment you've made in these ideas. Please give a round of applause to Marvin Olasky. Thank you. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. 
It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at actin.org. Until next week, for Actin Line, I'm Eric Combs.